Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Manubhadra's webinar on Supreme Court Clerkship Exam, Cracking the Code with Prerna Deep. The clerkship exam is a highly competitive process which selects candidates to work with the honorable judges of the Supreme Court of India. To guide us about the exam, its preparations, the opportunities it gives rise to, we are excited to have Ms. Prerna Deep. Prerna cleared the clerkship exam and worked with the honorable Mr. Justice Anirudh Bose. She is the recipient of the coveted British Council Great Scholarship for pursuing her LLM in criminal law at University of Edinburgh. Prerna currently serves as an academic fellow at the National Law University, Delhi. And in this role, she contributes to the academic development, guiding students and participating in cutting edge legal research. We are excited to have you today with us, Prerna. Welcome and over to you. Oh, sorry, am I audible now? Yes. Perfect, yes. So uh, thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, I'm excited and happy to be here. So uh, in this session, uh, I'll quickly go through a different, my PPT, and I'll get to walk you through the basics of what clerkship is, who can apply, um, how the exams are, your, I have, a lot of questions from you and Manupatra has also given me questions in terms of how it has been going on so um, I'll wrap it up as quickly as I can so I can have more Q&A time with you all so I'll begin by sharing my screen just let me know if it's visible right is this visible yes perfect. okay perfect one second Yes, so I will start with what is a clerkship and why are you even interested in this? So basically, Supreme Court clerkship is a program where you as young legal scholars and just graduate law students go through an intense one year program under a Supreme Court judge where you would be assisting a judge in his everyday matters in the judgments and any other assistance that particular judge needs. So basically how when you join like a law firm, you become a legal associate, when you join an advocate, you're like a junior associate, junior advocate. Similarly, the lawyers who are basically working with judges and assisting them in their day-to-day -day work are Supreme Court Law Clerks. So the program is called Supreme Court Law Clerk uh, Come Research Associate. So moving further, what is the eligibility criteria? So you have to be a law graduate to be a Supreme Court law clerk. So you can apply while you're in your final year of law. So by the time your results come out uh, of your final year, you also have your results coming out of the clerkship exam and everything, and then you can join directly. And of course, after you've graduated and you've worked a few years, you can even join them. So as you can see, the age must not be below 20 years and must not be above 32 years. So I'm using the 2024 guidelines and everything uh, to present what is here right now. Um, so since you guys would be applying either for the 2025 or later clerkship program, so kindly ensure that you have a look at the latest syllabus and latest guidelines if there are any changes or anything because um and you also would like to clarify here that the clerkship program was completely revamped in 2023 in terms of the salary in terms of the selection in terms of examination process everything so please have a lookout for the next exam uh, I don't think that they would change it this often, but yes, that's just a disclaimer to do your due diligence. So like I already said, you can be a law graduate, your age limit, you, or you can be a final year student. Of course, since you would be assisting the judge in not just day-to-day -day basis in the file, but also judgments and research work, you should have great research and analytical skills, writing abilities, you know how much the IT department of the Supreme Court is functioning. So you should also have great knowledge of computers and ability to just retrieve information from various search engines like Manupatra, SEC, 
Westlaw, Nexus, Nexus, all of those. Now the part one of the examination is the objective type. And you have 0.25 negative marking for this part. As you can see, these are through 0.5 hours and 100 marks. So you have three types of question. The first would be the English passage based question where you would be given an English passage and you would be asked question on the basis of your passage, which is like in any other competitive exam you sort of give. So you know what to expect in it. It could be a direct question. You could be asked grammar base, you could be asked synonym, intonym, or it could be as deep as some analytical question. But of course, it would be objective type. So that is for type A. Type B is the questions, again, objective type, would be testing your analytical skills and your application of law. So the main six statutes that come in the type B questions are CRPC, IPC, IPC, uh, CPC, Constitution, Indian Evidence Act, and Contract Act. So um, in this, you might not be asked directly or oh, what does this section, oh, sorry. You might not be asked directly on what does this section say perhaps, but more like an application based. So you might also be in certain conditions, be provided with some relevant portion of a section and have analytical question asked on that or application-based question. So I would recommend reading your bear acts very, very carefully for this. And the third type is the recent developments in law and jurisprudence in the last year, which, um, so this year, if you admitted, the Supreme Court had released a list of relevant cases for law clerkship, which was, I think, a list of around 35 cases that you should know from point of view of clerkship. So this does not, this does not take us. Uh, this does not per se take into consideration exactly your general objective type questions in terms of competitive exams, in terms of your static GK, or in terms of what happened where, but mostly like the legal development questions on the basis of case laws and the basis of the jurisprudence that has developed over the year and on the basis of the latest pieces. So I'll just go through how you can prepare for all of this later while right now I'm just like sort of uh, summarizing what all to be done. Now, for the part two, it's for 3.5 hours and it is 300 marks. So the question one is brief preparation uh, where you would be required to prepare a brief synopsis for a case file, which is no longer than 750 words. Uh, which is approximately two sides of a single page. Um, so you would be provided with a copy of SMP or a appeal, which could be civil or criminal, or a petition for it. Uh, and then you have to, so again, I'll just go in brief on how do you prepare it. So basically how you will be tested on the brief preparation is you need to identify the relevant facts because you will get a huge paper, you will get a huge case book and you would be asked to make a brief in two pages. So it's very important that you can identify the relevant facts of this. Then you need to identify the main issues, which are before the high court, which are before the trial court, which are before the commission. Um, so you have to keep that in mind. Then you have to summarize everything in your own words. So please do not like copy paste from what is given in the file, but at the same time, do not take the liberty of adding your own opinion. This has to be unbiased objective piece. So you should not be giving your own opinion in the brief preparation. It should be what is actually there. So how do you go about is you basically, you write the case number, you write the name of the parties, you write the relevant provision, you write the relevant quotes, and then you, the high court judgment is the most important part here because usually it comes from the interim judgment of high court, the Supreme Court. So you need to start looking at the high court judgment very, very carefully. Then the key point is the file is going to be large and you might feel like everything is important, but what is important is that you can extract exactly what's needed. So the best way to prepare for it to practice reading files 
if you have access like if you've been interning anywhere or if you your college provides you with guides such as case files for competitions and stuff or otherwise you can definitely find it online so start creating the files because it will take you time to get used to it and then you can proceed with the brief preparation now question number two is preparation of research memo so how do you go about preparing research memo is firstly you have to remember it should be very well structured it should be again it's concise so as you can see both the questions you have 750 words as your upper limit. So try not to exceed the word limit because mastering a huge file into a few words is also a skill that you will be tested and you are tested on. Because more often than not, you will get these files of more than 500, 600 pages and you'll have to summarize it in 500 and 1,000 words. So this is a skill that they are testing and this is a skill that you need to develop so do not think you oh just because you feel like everything is important you need to mention everything no you are not supposed to mention everything you need to be very wary of what you're mentioning so again how do you make a draft research memo you will have to address the facts then you will have to frame an issue now the frame and issue part is basically you'll have to see what kind of issue when i say frame an issue what i mean is if this case goes to supreme court and supreme court reads the case what is the question that is arising in their mind that needs to be resolved that is the question of issue so it's, it could be either the question of law it should be it's hardly ever a question of fact because it's supreme court level as you might know so you need to frame the issues and then you need to answer on how you will you be proceeding and how you're proceeding so you'll be given everything right so you'll be given the entire cases so all the material will be provided to you you just have to extract the relevant information and present it in a way that it is convincing so there must be laws case laws some might be applicable in which direction you're going some might not be so it's recommended that even if you're not using certain case laws try to mention in a line or two why it's not applicable in this circumstances third is the analytical question now in this again please keep in mind you have to answer one out of five questions it's from 350 to 500 words so quite short what you have to do is basically write again in a very structured and constructive manner your english will be tested your sentence formation will be tested your syntax your grammar and of course your actual legal knowledge so do not pick a question just because you think it's more relevant or it's more popular or more in discourse pick up a question in which you have knowledge on and pick up a side on which you can actually write because content matters so these are the three type of questions in part two. Now, yeah, going to the preparation strategy. So, of course, for interview, I would say you can watch mock interviews and you can also try mock interviews with your friends. And in general, with the uh, probably if you know somebody who's cracked the clerkship exam and has gone through this process because you would have a panel for the interview, and the panel could be, it's not a fixed panel, so the panel could consist of the registrar, the judges, the questions they ask can vary from anywhere super technical to super general. Um, they can also give you, for example, a comprehension to read and analyze it on the spot. They can give you an article and ask your views on it, or just in general, ask your views on some relevant topic. So the interview totally depends on the panel. So there's no one way to prepare for the interview, but just, of course, keep your general questions ready on why clerkship, why, why do you want to work with a particular judge, why do you want to work here, what do you want to do in the future. Again, if you have an area of specialization, questions on that, just general affairs and legal updates, landmark judgments, all of that. 
now how to start your exam preparation is firstly understand the exam pattern and syllabus because the syllabus has been revamped recently it might be confusing for you to find enough material online but at the same time you need not refer to material much before the pattern was changed because it was a lot of it was very different so try to look at 2023 onwards which is like two years only but it will give you a lot of guidance um then practice with the model papers and the previous papers and uh, maybe the english comprehension and all some part you can take away from even the previous year papers but not the other part so sort of match the previous syllabus with the new syllabus if you want to use the previous year question papers and see where you land of course you need to develop your critical thinking analytical skills what i mean by that is when you read something and you're asked to write on it there are two ways you can write one is descriptive one is analytical in descriptive thinking what you do is for example if i read somewhere that um there's a difference between robbery and equity so if i'm writing a descriptive principle i would probably just be like oh yeah this book says there's a difference between robbery and equity on this 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 basis abc but if i'm writing an analytical piece i would write that okay this book says this 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 or robbery and equity however this is how they have come to this conclusion this is where i stand this is where i see it going what is the other side of the view i need to present a better comprehensive picture of the whole thing rather than just repeating or paraphrasing what one person or one book says so critical thinking and analytical skills need to be developed and polished and it's better to start working on it because in even if not for clerkship you would require it general in law again stay updated with current affairs not the static gk but just general what is happening in law so for that you can um look at you know like manpatra ssc live law by and bench for just like general legal news read the law famous law journals just to have an idea on what is going on around you um supreme court have now also started that sc chronicles recently so uh, that's like a monthly newsletter which also captures the essence of what is happening so probably something you you should look into um again the judgments that supreme court like they released for 2024 exam if they review it again later the list of judgments if it's like 30 35 whatever it is read that thoroughly those judgments you should really most definitely know um and to prepare for like provisions or general law start with the bare acts there's nothing better than knowing the bare act and starting with it because you are not at least till now you're not given any directly question on a provision that you need to like learn by heart but it's more application based so you are ideally provided with at least a selected portion or some portion of the provision but in case you are not if you have read your bare acts thoroughly you would be able to answer those questions now going ahead this is just about if you like because of course like all of these can be one separate session each um i had continued writing on the supreme court law clerkship so these are some of the things that i covered online which you can see on linkedin it's just to give you an idea of what i covered before this exams now going ahead so now the relevant sources this is all available at the supreme court website so the important judgments like i mentioned supreme court has released this the law clerk scheme again it is on supreme court official website you should thoroughly read it the previous year question paper is there i think one thing the supreme court released which was a great addition was a sample q and a guide so um these are the page numbers and relevant things that i picked them from 2024 exam guide so they have the general instruction on how to prepare brief and research memo on page 8 to 10 how to write the multiple choice based questions and how to answer the subjective written examination question including the three brief preparation draft research memo and analytical question 
with very it's a very well made sample guide of course it's not a bible that you okay if you just done exactly like this you will get through but it really helps and guides you so i would highly recommend you to go to the supreme court website and download their sample guide from the law clerkship exam this will really really help you now the selection process how it works so candidates need to have 40% minimum marks in part 1 of the exam or they are automatically rejected so you should have at least 40% or if they have a separate cut off later in the first part which is the objective one and once you are done with that only then you will be qualified for the only then your second round paper would be checked um now to qualify in part 2 which is the subjective based written part you need to secure a minimum of 50% marks or such cut off as may be specified so 40% in the p part 50% in part 2 now the registry will then prepare a result of written examination based on the combined marks secured in part 1 and part 2 um on your individual portal there would be the results announced to you and then the supreme court website will publish a list of candidates who will be considered for the interview and the cut off score on the basis of again the two parts and then you would be asked to give a preference list of judges offices and sequence of your choice to work under whom you intend to so i've gotten a lot of questions on this last year on how should we choose the judge now i would say a of course because it's supreme court so it's not like you have a roster system as intense as high courts where you would only be working on one type of case it's supreme court so every judge works in every type of case but again i would the things you need to keep in mind while selecting a judge of course is their seniority their area of interest the working hours so probably speak with their current law clerk or somebody who's clerk under them to know what the office environment is what kind of working hours there are what kind of what is the rigor of that office because how your clerkship experience will go and how you will utilize it in the future is 90% dependent on the judge you are with and just even how you are learning and how you are maximizing your impact and your output depends on the judge you are clerking with so i would recommend doing this step very rigorously and just ensure that the preference list that you're making is well thought of now yes i think it goes without saying but i don't think people actually understand the gravity of these two aspects uh the work life balance is i mean in general it's very limited in law and especially so in clerkship because mondays and fridays are miscellaneous days so you have more than 60 70 cases which means having sunday off is extremely hard now again it depends on the judge's office but there might be 6 days working there might be 7 days working i know some judges office who never had a off in months and i know judges office who would have weekly or sand sunday off but it's extremely demanding and it's very rare so just because the supreme court closes for 2 months doesn't really mean you will also get a 2 months break because again i would say it be this again and again actually depends on judge to judge so your experience might be completely different from what i'm saying but this has been my experience my friends and everybody i know so you would be asked to work at odd times you would be working on holidays you would be working on festivals you would be working on from midnight to early morning depending on what kind of judgments or what kind of research work you're doing and it just shifts so much and it's so demanding that you 
you will have a very difficult time just being at home or just like catching up with your friends and everybody so that is a trade that you need to think of before accepting the role that you're willing to put because you will you're not just supposed to be in the office or but you also have to just give so apply so much brain at every aspect of it because the work is just so high risk which will come again and just so professional that you need to be present and you need your 100% mind applied on it all the time so please keep this in mind now about the fact it's a high risk job of course, of course it's the ethics code you know everything that goes from the supreme court becomes even if you're making an oral remark that's going on the court right now it just becomes like a breaking news so there is no room for mistake at the supreme court level you really need to put in your best foot every day all the time because if you commit one mistake in a note or in a judgment or wherever if it's in a judgment it will become a college agenda which again no but he wants to have a college agenda done if it's in a note and then let's say your judge relies on your note and there's a mistake in that and he speaks about and he goes under the impression that it's correct and later finds out it was a mistake it would be really quite bad and embarrassing not just for him but also then you lose your credibility so you need to proof check everything that you are writing that you're discussing that you're telling 100 times before doing it to ensure there is no mistake i mean of course some things sometimes go wrong but otherwise you need to always be overtly cautious of what you're doing in the position as a law clerk um now the career opportunities after clerkship of course you can pursue a career in litigation um clerkship just yeah it is a great great way to learn what is going on on the other side of the bench how a judge's mind works what they look for in a file or how they process the arguments everything everything that you need for litigation you do learn in a clerkship you can pursue your research further or you can pursue academia because again those research and analytical skills will come very handy in these two areas of course students also go for good educational institutions like in india abroad for their higher studies and then you can also prepare for judicial upsc and other competitive exams in law i will go a little further on this later so yes there's some myths that i would want to burst firstly clerkship is super hectic and you will not have time to prepare for exams during your clerkship time so if you think oh we we'll do clerkship and side by side we will have sufficient time to prepare for our exams it would not be an easy task of course you can do it but it will be very time consuming and very tedious because clerkship in itself is so demanding and to have and to prepare for exams in addition to that simultaneously is going to be very difficult so if you th- if you just joining clerkship that you'll have one sort of job and flow of money on the side while you actually focus on your exam it will not work like that you will not have that much time in clerkship again it's not a form of employment per se because this is a one year contractual basis which can be extended but it is a temporary position and this is useful for somebody who's entering the law field to gain first hand experience by working under a judge i think you can best utilize it if you are an early career professional who's not had much experience yeah that's again this is my humble opinion that this is something which i would see as a stepping stone of a career than an actual career itself now the third point is the cv value and opportunities that just comes with clerkship it doesn't 
of course there's CV value and all of these things, but it is not automatic. Your, if your CV is absolutely, for the lack of better word, rubbish, apart from the clerkship, it might not do a lot for you. It will add to your profile if you already have a good profile. Or it can make your not so good profile look okay, but it will not work like a magic. And even in terms of, oh, are we applying for, uh, when you're applying for like higher studies, LOR, that getting from a judge, of course, it will do you wonders, but it is not everybody receives one. I know a lot of people do get and most of the people do get, but again, depends on your judge. So if getting an LOR is your only motivation, then I think you should probably think once about it because what if you don't end up getting one? Because it's totally discretionary upon the judge to give you an LOR. And I've, I've known a few who haven't received it. And of course, I've known a few who have received it. But if this is the only motivation that you need to get your facts straight. Also, uh, about scholarship and the chances of getting a scholarship after clerkship, I would say it increases, yes, but it does not mean it increases super significantly or something. Again, it will function according to your profile. So, while it would enhance your chances of getting a scholarship, it will not work like magic. And it's not like if you don't have a clerkship, you will not be able to get a scholarship because I got a scholarship before my exams. Before, in the sense, like I pursued clerkship after my master's. So I already had a scholarship. I already had my master's. So I had none of that as a motivation for me in clerkship. My whole sole motivation was to working under a judge and learning the best out of it. And that's what I got out of it. So these are just some myths about it that you should be careful about. Of course, and anytime you might not even get a, so a LOR for LLM is separate than LOR for scholarship. You might get one from your judge, but not the other one. It can function either way. So again, just think about it very, very carefully. Now, yes, so I've tried to cover most of the questions that were asked in my presentation itself. I thought I'll just leave some here to address them directly. Um, about the salary, it's 80,000 fixed stipend per month. And if it's extended after one year, your tenure, then your salary would be 90,000 per month. So that settles the case for the salary of fixed stipend. Um, is prior publication needed for clerkship? No, it's not. It's not a prerequisite. Um, while prior, if you have prior publication, it might help you with your analytical and research skills. It's not a prerequisite. And if you have zero publication, you can still very well do good in your clerkship. So don't let that be a barrier for your application. Do people with recommendations stand a better chance? So this is with respect to exams versus non-exams. Again, the Supreme Court has a different quota for it. So there are certain reservations for exams, candidates who are writing, and certain for recommendation-based. Uh, so just because so if you're writing an exam, you will be taken, your work would be against that quota. And then if you're not writing an exam and if you're getting through recommendation, it's a separate pool for that. So it's it works differently. Do we need to study the new criminal laws for exams? I honestly do not know, but I am guessing you would be considering it's coming into force from July. Um, but again, I think when the Supreme Court releases their new real syllabus, you should definitely check it up on that. My guess would be yes, but I can't say for certain. Is there any need for prior experience? No, there is no need for prior experience. Why having an advanced degree like LLM or just like having great internships really helps you ease you into the system? It's not a requirement per se. What step should a judiciary aspirant take for the clerkship exam? So I don't know if this means like what 
should you do to prepare for the exam or what you should do after your exam. If it's about what you should do to prepare for the exam that I've already discussed, and if it's about can you prepare simultaneously with the clerkship, again, I've discussed this, and about what you should do after or if the syllabus matches or something. I've never thought of doing judiciary. I've never prepared for it, so I wouldn't know much on this. Uh, what value will a clerkship help me in terms of obtaining LLM from an IV college and securing a scholarship? So again, like I mentioned, it does help but it does not help like magic so it's not like just because you have it everything will be sorted but it definitely adds to your overall profile uh yes so thank you uh, i'll be taking questions uh, now and then of course if you want to get in touch with me you can just drop me a message on linkedin you can see my profile up here or just write me an email so perfect i'll just stop sharing my um, screen and then I get to the questions. Thank you so much for that, Prerna. It was really insightful and uh, your PPT, I have to say, it was remarkable. Thank I mean, you. Not, only it, not only did it have the perfect, uh, you know, responses that I think the, student, the aspirants were looking for, but it was quite engaging as well. Thank so, you, you know, we are so used really to, to hear. yeah i know i really tried it <laughs> yeah no, but this was really engaging like uh, I, i'm not exactly uh, looking to pursue but i, I got interested oh okay the, this is the exam pattern <laughs> okay are uh, these the questions we have to prepare so it's really really thank you so we already have a few questions in our chat board should we start with them i'll just read them yeah, out sure. okay so one of them is can one apply for supreme court clerkship immediately after finishing law school Yes, like I said, yes, you can. Yeah. Uh, uh, can one get clerkship just by doing internships under a judge? Um, you can, again, if the judge likes your work and they, again, judges have the discretion to take somebody outside the examination system, like I just mentioned. So if you're interning with a judge and they like your work, they can offer your clerkship program. Yes. So that's a subjective thing that depends on yes, the judge. again, discretion of the judge. Yeah, I think uh, to assume that just because you're interning under a judge, that will convert no, no, into no. clerkship is a bit... No, no, no. Yeah, it's yeah, it's like, yeah, it won't happen. It's not like, you know, you also like intern in a lot of firms. does not mean you become a new yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Thing as so, no, because I, I also interned under, um, in, under a judge at the Supreme Court and I applied through the registry. So that's a random allocation. While yes, the clerkship yes, exam yes. is a proper, you know, like you explained, it's a proper preparation and everything. So it cannot equate. See, I think the, yeah, the, like you mentioned, the foremost thing to remember is these are Supreme Court judges. They have yeah. a lot of discretion. <laughs> I think they have the most discretion. You're right. Okay. So another question is, is knowledge of search engines like Manupatra re relevant for the exam? Yes, it is the must. You cannot emphasize on just like having the knowledge of search engines if you don't already have it, which I mean, I would assume you would require a lot in your law school as well. But in yeah. case you haven't yet, just please, yeah, just brush up those skills because the kind of things you will have to just find out of nowhere with just <laughs> random keywords is just insane. So yes, you need to. Okay, so um, not as much for the exam maybe, but for what's coming after yes yeah what's so, coming after uh -huh. so because obviously these search engines they help a lot manupatra uh, has everything so because okay. they might ask for Post. something in the interview again depends on the panel so just like randomly to test you you can just okay. get something but you're yeah, not for the written exam okay so another is, uh, this is actually a question that we receive quite often is, uh, is it a good idea to start career from clerkship if the goal is to do litigation in the uh, at the Supreme Court? Yes, it is. Um, because like my uh, boss used to say that one year of clerkship is equal to five years of litigation if you do it right. What do you mean? And I, yeah, if you, I mean, you just, the thing is with clerkship is nobody will, sort of spoon feed you or something on it it would be uh you would have to take the initiatives on your own 
so if you're not taking the initiatives on your own you might not find it that useful but if you are making use of the opportunity then 100% it's yeah it's five years of just litigation uh, that's really good information and that's a very good line <laughs> That, I know, you know I love this line when he told me. Yeah, he's like, yeah, okay, no, one year yeah. of clerkship, five years of litigation. If you can do it right, yeah, you should have just written it down. Wait, what? That <laughs> happened. <laughs> That's nice. Uh, can a member of the Supreme Court bar also be eligible to apply for clerkship who is already practicing before the Supreme Court? You can, but then you will not be practicing while you are doing the clerkship. So you need to. just like give away your license and all and that amount that time will not be counted as a practice even for judiciary and stuff so this has been very contentious so the hours that you the years that you put in in your clerkship is apparently still not counted as practice years even for judicial exams so be oh. careful for that yeah i think your But, uh, no myth breaking that slide was uh, quite interesting no because, yeah, because uh, people, yeah, people like, just the clerkship will get a lor and then we're done so great let's it's just one yeah. of investment yes and i've known judges who have used lor also yeah so it's important to have these myths uh, you know debunked uh, so what are the resources available to prepare for the exam so like i said you don't really need coaching or mm. you don't really need to because Like buy books per se just for the clerkship. I don't even think there's anything super relevant even in the market. But the absolute one first thing is again barracks. If you read the barracks thoroughly and if you just read the judgments, like and when I say read judgments, I mean read the actual judgments, not summaries from anywhere. because wow. that would just help you so much so yeah just like if you're reading a breaking news one line and you think you know the judgment that will not help you but if you read the mm -hmm. actual judgments and if you read the actual bare acts and just practice english comprehension from anywhere and probably just read case files so just like when you're doing your internships and all which is mandatory mm -hmm. you should just probably just try to read the case files in that Way where you can actually prepare notes and do pages. So your perspective changes while uh, reading uh, judgments or bare acts and everything. Once you are yes, in, yes, uh, yes. Uh, for this, so can you just give me one second? I'll mute myself. Uh, as you can see, the Q and A is on. So if you have any more questions for. Prerna, please uh, don't he hesitate, and you can just write them in the chat. Will the PPT be shared? Yes, the PPT will be available uh, at uh, Manupatra Academy. We'll uh, we'll be sharing the link once we send you the confirmation, and once we have it up on our website. Lot of requests for the PPT. We will definitely be sharing this. Uh, and yes, thank you for that uh, uh, remark. We will have the recording also up. So we have a page at uh, Manubhadra Academy where we put in all our recordings of the webinars, and this one will be available there as well. Welcome so, back. Yes. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yes. Uh, any more questions? Yeah, yeah. So uh, if a person's motive is to only go for judiciary. Shall the exam of clerkship? Should the person go for the clerkship exam? Ah, uh, I don't know if you mean in terms of if the preparation would help, because ah, uh, like I said, I had never thought of judiciary. I've never invested in that, so I've never really looked at from that point of view. But again, that as you can see, judiciary requires. Judiciary, judicial exams require a lot of more work than clerkship exams, because the acts are just so much, and you will have direct to very direct provision wise questions in judicial exams, which is not the case so much in clerkship. It's more application based. So while it might assist you in some ways, just because you're preparing for clerkship will not make you qualified as preparing for judicial exams. Okay, that's fair. 
um, another is for fifth year students looking to apply for clerkship what would work as proof of acquiring law qualification so basically you will be um submitting your marks till like your last semester and you will be giving an undertaking that you oh, you're writing your final year exams right now and you will be joining in after that comes out so there's this undertaking that okay if you fail in your final semester exams and then even if you've gotten through clerkship exam of course they will not take you yeah so that's a very pertinent yeah. question yes i know so yes uh, you need to have an usually an undertaking that okay and also they have i think this option in the form where they ask you are you like a law graduate or are you like a final oh, year student okay okay fair enough so does a clerkship uh, help in any way to get a job in a firm not really no i mean depends i would say also on your overall profile so if your overall profile is something which is on the practice areas of that particular firm that you want to get into then of course it will but if you think that only working as a law clerk will get you a job in the firm then it not might be the best idea because it's more towards litigation than a corporate law firm right right good that we are being honest uh, yeah. you know there's no, there's no point in uh, painting a rosy picture of course exactly uh, it's important to just be honest here uh the subjects which were mentioned in the ppt for the clerkship exam are final or do we need to go through any other subjects also so those are the primary subjects but like i said supreme court does release their when they call for applications every year they do mention it so again for 2025 do check this was on the basis of 2024 exam which already happened in march so for the next year even though these have been the common trend i would recommend you to thoroughly go through the subject that they have shared and the syllabus that they have shared all right and uh, are there other such internship opportunities for law graduates okay that's a little not relevant for the uh clerkship, the clerkship is not internship just yeah. like, okay, don't get confused please i like how you mentioned that uh, there's no work life balance and you know there are no yeah, because people. there is no because and i mean yeah honestly when i went i thought oh supreme court has like so many breaks right for like breaks such <laughs> long holy break and all but then you realize those breaks are just for you to even work hard <laughs> and get yeah. up and another thing that uh, you know you should not think like these are uh, your stepping stone like you can go and study for your competitive exams because there are just so many people i know who take up the clerkship like yeah side 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 maybe we'll prepare for our judiciary and all and they are not yeah, very happy. i know i recently spoke to somebody who did that and i was like why did you take clerkship then and they replied galti ho gayi <laughs> so ha very honest yeah they were just very honest they were like galti ho gayi please yeah they're already chatting in it there are two questions on the salary that the atk stipend that you mentioned is in hand or ctc wow it's a contractual job you don't have ctc and in hand it's just atk of course 10 percent will be deducted because TDS, of yes yeah yeah tds but yeah that's it it's a stipend that is why it doesn't come under regular salary salary it comes as a stipend correct and which month does the application form for the uh, exam usually come like are the exams uh, every year uh, in march usually okay. yeah march april usually other exam dates and then it usually comes somewhere between january and february every year okay so okay january and february will be the answer yeah. to this uh what is the interview process like post exam so like i mentioned the interview depends a lot on the panel so it could be a cake walk from just like general questions about why right. clerkship who are you kind of question to actual technical legal questions to also asking you for your opinion on certain legal crisis or just legal development or actually giving you something to read and analyze it on the spot oh wow that's tough yeah 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 some people have been put in that position so yes okay do we have anything else i think we've covered most of it
yeah the yeah, the rest of them are for your uh, amazing ppt uh, <laughs> Please do share the same with us. Uh, Prina, I think we've uh, neared the end of the session anyway, and we've covered most of the questions. So I think we can wrap this up here. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much again. Yeah, well, and uh, we'll we'll share your details with the participants so that if they have any queries or anything, they can always reach out to us and you. Definitely. Thank you so much for accepting. No, of course. Thank you for having me. It was lovely. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you everyone for joining.